everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. For this one, our headlining item is direct news from AMD, officially about the delay of the 3950X, but also confirmation of launch for Threadripper and the 3950X, both in November. So that'll be our headliner. There's an IQ version from Corsair that just came out. Coincidentally, the same week we reviewed their, actually the same week their new case launched with IQ in the name, and that IQ version is uh, producing some issues with gameplay for some drop frame rates, bloatware doing what it does. And the Epic 7742 with some world firsts that we'll talk about. And uh, ray tracing news, ARM joining CXL, Windows scheduler targeting the wrong cores, TSMC news, and some other stuff. Before that, this video is brought to you by Be Quiet and its Straight Power 11 series power supplies. The Straight Power 11 PSUs ship from 450 watts up to 1,000 watts, accommodating most of the gaming PC build requirements you'd encounter, and focuses on delivering a higher quality power supply that doesn't sacrifice on efficiency or stability. Noise is also a heavy point for the Straight Power 11, using a 135mm Silent Winds 3 fan that can spin as low as 200 RPM for quieter, low load operation. Learn more at the link in the description below. Just briefly, on the table in front of me is a bunch of Nintendo Switch Lite parts. If you want to see a teardown of something that's not a video card, and you'd like to see something different that's still technology and gaming related, and deals with small components crammed into one of these cases, you can check that out on the channel. It should be up already. We're losing buttons from the Switch. Uh, that's on the channel already at this point. But AMD. So we got this email from AMD as we were filming the Switch teardown. And Andy emailed the press on Friday, giving us about one to two hours maximum notice. We had about 30 minutes notice of an embargo lift on the 3950X being delayed. And so what AMD emailed out was the following quote. AMD said, we are focusing on meeting the strong demand for our third generation AMD Ryzen processors. Okay, let's stop right there. As soon as you read that in a statement, you know, uh-oh, what's happening now? Uh, so in continuing that, they said, we now plan to launch both the 3950X and initial members of the third-gen AMD Ryzen Threadripper processor family in volume this November. We are confident that when enthusiasts get their hands on the world's first 16-core mainstream desktop processor and our next-gen HEDT processors, the wait will be well worth it. And this isn't entirely on AMD at this point. TSMC is actually really struggling to keep up with demand right now, and that's another one of the news items for today. We talked about how TSMC is sort of a victim of its own success, and that everybody wants its 7 nanometer process, and the lead time now is upwards of six months. So if you're AMD, you place an order today, maybe AMD might rank a little higher in the, in, in the list of customers for TSMC, but it's possible that that lead time order place today might be six months from now. And so for those of you asking, why is there still no 3900X in my region, where my region is most regions, that's part of the answer. Uh, the rest of it would be pro probably binning or yields or something like that, but availability of fab space is one of the big ones. So there are no signs that signal TSMC's recent report of increased delivery times uh, are the only culprit. It's a potential contributor, and these battling its own issues uh, with bidding out its processors and, and meeting demand for each of the different positions in the stack. Andy is currently one of TSMC's biggest clients for 7 nanometer, which is still new, alongside Apple for its A13 SoC, another massive client. And so TSMC is likely pushing the increased delivery times out to less premium clients, but it might affect Apple and AMD as well, or certainly AMD if not Apple. Recent IQ versions, we'll talk more about TSMC in a moment. So peripheral software, which is uh, everyone's favorite type of software to install. If you buy a keyboard and a mouse from two different companies and then a headset from a third company, you now need three different pieces of bloatware to bog down your system and uh, open up security vulnerabilities like Asus's does for malware attacks. That's always a nice add-on to your keyboard, uh, So, which can be keylogged, I guess, through that software. So peripheral software, not anyone's favorite really, but at best, you get a bloated application with security vulnerabilities and some dropped frames. At worst, you get the sort of unintuitive labyrinthian menus to dig through, or you get Corsair's IQ or NTXC's CAM, to be fair, and we'll talk more about that later this week. Uh, so many of the users on Corsair's forums have noticed spikes in CPU usage, as well as seen frame rate drops and stuttering in games, 
It seems that rolling back to an older version of IQ solves the problem, as some have noted on those forums. The version of IQ currently causing issues, if you want to avoid it, is 3.19.120, and so far Corsair hasn't dropped a new version. Corsair doesn't appear to have a place to get the older versions officially, so you'll have to employ some tricks, like maybe Softpedia, to revert to an older version, as discussed in that forum thread. Or just uninstall the software and not install it again. But you do lose, unfortunately, some of the product functionality for physical products now. They're actually all baked into software, which makes it a bit difficult. Beamer Imaging is laying claim to the world's first real-time 8K HEVC encoding using a single socket 64-core AMD Epic 7742 CPU. The Epic 7742 encoded 8K footage in real-time at 79 frames per second with 10-bit HDR color. Beamer 5 looks to be optimized for parallelization as it saturates all 64 cores of the Epic 7742 processor as noted by the corporate vice president and chief technology officer at AMD. And the quote from uh, that same person was, we are excited to join Beamer with bringing high performance software based video encoding powered by AMD Epic 7002 series processors to the market. It's impressive to see Beamer 5 consistently loading all cores in both single socket and dual socket configurations. Next up, talking about ray tracing, Wargaming uh, had its Wargaming Fest Tanker Day event. And Wargaming makes likely some games you've heard of. World of Warships, World of War Planes, World of Tanks, stuff like that. And uh, their new announcement is that working with the Intel API, the Intel One API, it looks like World of Tanks should be getting ray tracing support. So this is a bit interesting right now. Although the ray tracing in the game appears to be limited at present, the announcement has significant implications because it means that any graphics cards can benefit, including DirectX 11 cards, and it's not just RTX-enabled devices that will get the gains from this move. Wargaming will update its core game engine to include ray tracing support, as well as introduce concurrent rendering. And the quote from Wargaming was, with the introduction of our ray tracing technology developed at Wargaming with close collaboration with Intel, we can recreate the main actors of our game in higher quality. Their smallest details will give super realistic shadows when the sun hits them. Ray tracing further immerses you in an atmosphere of furious tank combat and provides an even more enjoyable gameplay experience. So that's the quote from Wargaming. And the, the most interesting thing here, really, outside of the marketing fluff quote, is working with Intel on this, not the obvious NVIDIA choice. So we're going to pay attention to this one and potentially look at it. World of Tanks isn't a new game. It's not the most visually impressive game, but doing something different with ray tracing uh, deserves at least distantly paying attention to, if not doing some more involved testing. And I guess let us know what your interests are in that in the comments. ARM joining the CXL. It's safe to say that the Compute Express Link, or CXL, uh, consortium has become too big to ignore at this point. AMD is the most recent member of CXL. The group also consists of other heavyweights like Microsoft, Google, Intel, and NVIDIA, and again, most recently AMD. And the goal of the CXL is to develop specifications for new high-speed interconnects, and uh, specifically a new high-speed CPU interconnect aimed at heterogeneous computing. ARM was the last major CPU developer holding out, but not anymore. ARM has now officially joined the CXL. Given ARM's massive ecosystem and the fact that so many vendors license IP from ARM, the CXL gaining support from ARM is huge. It also raises questions about the future of CCIX, of which ARM has been a big supporter. For now, ARM notes that, quote, we expect to maintain CCIX to support inner package chip-to-chip -chip interfaces that are currently not in the scope of CXL. We'll continue to support customer solutions based on existing CCIX hardware. Reading between the lines here, ARM is signaling that it believes CXL is the future, and ARM will also continue to support the Gen Z interconnect. It remains a member of the Gen Z consortium as well. Uh, however, with so much traction behind the CXL, with all those industry heavyweights in it, it seems the new interconnect wars are over before they ever really started. So as successful as AMD has been with Ryzen 3000 series CPUs, it obviously hasn't come without some difficulties in the launch. This isn't really news for most CPU launches. The main one has been difficulties hitting those boost clocks that were advertised. We've talked about this. We did some testing of our own, and we also talked about it at launch with some of the reviews, although the 3600 
pretty much always hit that target. It was the others that had issues at the higher core counts. And all of this discussion online uh, and AMD's own internal testing did push AMD to eventually develop a new AGISA update. We've already tested that on our channel for some performance. You can see our findings on the channel already. And Paul Alcorn with Tom's Hardware has further looked into this and discovered that AMD is now encountering issues where the Windows scheduler and AMD CPUs are once again in conflict with how they're behaving. Specifically, it seems that the two, AMD and the scheduler, can't reconcile differences in terms of core assignment. While testing the 3900X with AMD's recent firmware and BIOS optimizations, Alcor noted two key problems. First, the chip was boosting inactive cores, essentially wasting the boost clock and killing any tangible performance gain. Then the scheduler was aimlessly lobbying workloads at cores without really much thought put into it, and often bursty workloads were ending up in, in slower cores. Both of the problems are exacerbated by the fact that AMD uses a combination of slow and faster bend cores for Ryzen 3000. And in summation, Alcorn, uh, and you should read his article, notes that while AMD did correct the boost clock deficiency, the fix doesn't regularly uh, equate to increased performance. Like what Paul Alcorn from Tom's was saying, we would also like to see AMD continue to optimize Zen 2 and refine this to a point where it's more predictable and resolved, especially on the Windows scheduler and how it assigns workloads. Some of that will be done with Microsoft as well. For what it's worth, when we ran through our test suite, we reran the numbers several times with uh, when those BIOS updates came out, we used fresh AGISA versions, fresh uh, installs, fresh data and everything. So we had the newest AGISA update, which was the ABBA update, and then we had the one just before that, ABB. Tested those back to back, so we weren't working with old data, and managed to see a very slight improvement in performance. That was typically about one to two percent in average FPS. There were a couple. There was one outlier, Total War, where it was higher than that, but it did reproduce multiple times. And so it seems that despite inefficiencies and despite not really boosting as we'd like to see from what Tom's hardware was saying, uh, and we do agree with what they're saying there. It's better to boost the cores actually doing stuff. There was still a gain on average across the games we tested and we were able to replicate those results. So there's a little bit there. It might be worth updating if you're having issues still, but uh, it could be done better. And one thing as an aside here, a lot of people sort of lost the plot with the 0.1% lows and frame times and 1% lows. And as a reminder, people like to look at this data and they sort of see what they want to see but that's not necessarily reality. So as a reminder, low performance, like 1% lows, 0.1% lows, that's selecting from a reduced uh, quantity of results to average, first of all. So you're reducing your averaging in terms of data points. And it's not, uh, because it's averages of averages, we're not talking just one data point per run. It's, it's a lot of them because you're dealing with potentially 60 plus, 100 plus frames per second, so multiply that by the duration of the run, you could end up with uh, tens of thousands of data points. But anyway, 1% lows and 0.1% lows have a much wider standard deviation and error than average FPS does, it's something we talk about in all the charts. But still, people are kind of looking at them and going, well, AG said ABB to ABBA, there's an 8% improvement in 0.1% lows. You can't really do that. You need to look at the averages for that one, despite what we typically say because in that one, it's an A-B test between a GISA A, a GISA B, and the variance run to run, when you're looking at the lows, is wide enough that you're looking at potential error of something like 4% or a standard deviation of somewhere in that range. So you can't really just jump and say, it's 8%, it's 10% better in 0.1% lows, because the data is just not there to really support that. It's a much wider standard deviation. Average is a different story. Uh, averages, we often see less than one FPS change depending on the game. So GTA is one of those where it's extremely accurate, less than one FPS average difference run to run. Anyway, I wanted to point that out because a lot of people did lose the plot on that. And then finally, uh, on this topic, Anantech also posted its own excellent article on boosting behavior. Ian Cutchis wrote it. He did a really good job. It's very detailed and lengthy and just wanted to point it out. So if you've missed it and you like to read some technical details on how Ryzen boosting behaves, Go check out his article. We'll link it in our show notes below as well.
uh, along with the Tom's Hardware article. TSMC delivery time triples under 7 nanometer demand, so it would seem that TSMC is a victim of its own success, as Digitimes is reporting that the company is expecting delivery lead times to triple under enormous demand for its 7 nanometer process. Digitimes reports that TSMC is increasing its lead times for 7 nanometer chips to six months, up from the previous two month delivery window. And uh, uh, the site also notes that TSMC is preparing budget increases for fab expansion and other process node advancements. Currently, TSMC likely has its hands full delivering 7 nanometer chips to AMD, which the chip maker is using in both Ryzen 3000 and Navi based RX 5700 series cards. Now, the last one, this one is sort of rumor status, but not, I mean, it's probably gonna be real. Chinese retailer JD listed a new AMD R53500X, and uh, also there's news of an R53500 non-X that might come out. So if these accidental retail listings are true, and of course things could change, there might be placeholder prices or specs, but let's just assume they are, the listing was about $150, $155 part for the 3500X. It said no SMT, so six cores, six threads, and it looks like it would follow the path of the other lower end R5 parts from previous like Ryzen first generation launches where uh, you cut out, cut out the SMT, cut down the boost clocks, and end up with a cheaper chip in favor of lower, you know, lower performance, lower price. So if the accidental listing proves to be true, AMD will mostly be matching up against itself. It's most in contention with the R5 2600, which these days is roughly around $130, actually a very good deal if you want to save some money on an R5 CPU. The 2600 series was our best all around that we chose for CPU awards last year for 2018. Still recommend it. $130 is really good for that. So AMD is competing with itself there with the 3500X. It'll be a bit more expensive in theory. And the 2600 is uh, stronger in some other ways, but might be weaker in, in some. We'll see. See how it does for... Uh, frequency and IPC and stuff like that. Uh, so we'll link the 2600 if you want to pick one up anyway, but the JD listing indicates a 4.1 gigahertz boost without SMT for the 3500X, and that would put it a few steps down from the R5 3600 while main maintaining the same uh, core count, just fewer threads. And so we'll pay attention to that one, but it also needs to prove to not be just a rumor. So that's it for the news this week. As always, you can find links to the notes in the description below if you'd like to see sources and other information, or you can go to store.gamersaccess.net to pick up shirts like this one, or our mod mats or toolkits, and go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus as well to get access to a new behind the scenes video that we just filmed in the studio. Thanks for watching, I'll see you all next time. That's interesting. That's how we should do the news. It should be like, I just read it quietly to myself and go, oh, interesting. Huh. What do you know? <laughs>